Hello, my name is Kevin Crowley. I'm a professor of learning sciences and policy at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, my work focuses on how people learn in out-of-school settings, and I've been particularly interested in the ways that people learn in museums. I've been working on some research initiative projects in the United States, which uh, perhaps have some relevance for the process that you're just launching. Uh, so today what I want to do with my eight minutes is to talk uh, very briefly about those as an introduction, and then I look forward to uh, joining you in London on future meetings uh, and um, working together uh, across the pond on some common ideas about uh, research and practice in natural history museums. So the first project I want to talk about today um, is a production of the Center for the Advancement of Informal Science Education. You can see this is our website here, informalscience.org. And our group is a National Science Foundation funded uh, center which uh, has the mission to support uh, informal science education in the United States. So probably the first thing to know about our research and practice work at CASE is we call it the Practice and Research Initiative. And we put practice before research. It was very intentional to remind ourselves and to communicate to the outside world that the questions of practice are probably the best place to start a conversation um, about research. Our particular conversation that we've been um, organizing at CASE has taken place uh, through a series of meetings, both in person and virtual, where several hundred uh, people from the field have gathered together to discuss what they're working on, uh, what questions they find interesting, both from the standpoint of practice and research. And then we've gone through a process of convening um, different groups that sift through that material and have identified some uh, big buckets uh, for questions that uh, we think represent um, promising places for us to start a conversation about practice and research in informal science. So here's the buckets. The first one, learning ecologies and change over time, refers to the fact that informal learning might be best thought of uh, not as an isolated moment in someone's life, but in the ways that it affects other kinds of learning um, throughout the lifespan. The second category refers to the particular kinds of learning that informal experiences support extremely well and some audiences that they support that maybe aren't supported well other places, such as families, for instance. How do we equip the citizens for the 21st century in an increasingly scientific and technological world? And what's the role of informal learning in that? The next two categories, um, identity, interest, motivation, and curiosity, are all examples of ways that people have um, thought about the outcomes of informal learning differently than just the knowledge and skills you might learn. There's a lot of excitement in the field right now about ways that these experiences build your identity or your passion for something like science. Design principles specifically, how do experiences best support informal learning? What are the methods, instruments, and assessments we have to use for informal learning, and particularly we noticed people were interested in rigorous assessments of outcomes that could withstand um, scrutiny from external audiences. It's a place where informal learning hasn't been particularly strong historically. And finally, how do we build capacity as a field to conduct research and to connect it with practice? And that's not just a, a meta question, that's really, are there things about the informal uh, world that we need to understand from a research perspective that will help us do a better job with professional development and will help us do a better job communicating um, with each other and with um, external stakeholders. So what are we going to do now at CASE that we have these categories? Um, our goal is to try to keep the conversation going and to figure out whether these categories are useful as a way to catalyze some work around the field. So we've been in communication with several other research initiative efforts, um, and I'll just briefly mention uh, two of those right now. The first one is organized by the Association of Children's Museums. They were funded uh, by the federal government in the States to uh, conduct a convening 
that brought together researchers and practitioners from the children's museum world and again asked these questions. Where are the common points of overlap, the low-hanging fruit that will help this uh, field of children's museums move forward? So here's the categories that they came up with at their convening. So I won't go through all of these in detail, um, but just look, for instance, with me right now at the top four. There, there's a fair amount of overlap with what the uh, case initiative produced. So the first question is this question of how do you grow a culture of research and learning in the museum field? The second one is what is characteristic, what distinguishes uh, children's museums in ways that advance uh, the development of children and family? Again, this question of what is the long-term impact, short-term impact, how do we measure that in ways that are um, rigorous? And finally, this question of ecosystems. What's the relationship between this learning environment and the other ones that constitute a healthy ecosystem for a growing child? So the Children's Museum Association hopes to uh, get a grant to advance this, they see doing it through partnerships between researchers and children's museums, building a network, which is something that uh, those of us at CASE are standing by to help them with. So the last uh, research agenda project I'd like to talk about is this project that Bill Watson's described to you uh, that he led at the Smithsonian with participation from really around the world. One of the outcomes of that conference was a set of ideas about a learning research agenda. Since then, Bill has been working with other people in the field, including those of us at the University of Pittsburgh, to whittle that down to a set of four primary buckets that we propose constitute the um, core of a learning research agenda for natural history museums. Authenticity refers to the authentic objects, the authentic collections, and the scientists who work inside museums. How do we best think about the kind of learning that takes place that's afforded by this rich collection of authentic resources in natural history museums? Priority content, I mean, natural history museums stand for things. They stand for the learning of evolution. They are concerned with climate change. They have in their collections important scientific and cultural stories that they have a responsibility to share with the world. So how can we do research in ways that we can figure out how people learned about something like evolution, what makes that difficult, and ways that we could use museum experiences to bridge some of those gaps. Mediation refers to all of the things we do inside a museum to support learning the uh, human resources we bring to bear, the technology, uh, signage, uh, educational programming. What are the best ways to support learning uh, in a place like a natural history museum? And finally, audiences. So certain kinds of people are particularly important for natural history museums to communicate with. Families, for example, was discussed a lot at the conference. Uh, many museums reported that half of their visitors were families. So what are some particular things about family learning that we ought to understand, for instance, um, if we're going to uh, improve practice within museums? So here at the University of Pittsburgh, we're going to be working with Bill Watson to take this research agenda the next step. We're going to be writing up in a little bit more detail what these uh, big four buckets might actually mean, how they connect to the existing literature, what are some examples of uh, existing work in natural history museums that um, reveal uh, some of the interesting sub-questions within these buckets, and also some work thinking about some new studies that might be launched in ways that help us converge on some um, common questions within these buckets that might be uh, fruitful places for a uh, research agenda to start. So I'll conclude my remarks today, and again, thanks for the invitation to join you, sir, I couldn't be there in person. I'll, I'll conclude by thinking about um, some of the things I've learned over the last year being involved in these three initiatives. And I, I think there's really three kind of takeaway lessons. The first is um, it's really important early on for 
researchers and practitioners to have a common conversation, to develop common languages, to be thinking about problems where they can both get excited about moving forward and working together. It's going to be intense and it's not going to be easy to pull off a Natural History Museum research agenda. And so people need to be invested in that and they need to know what the other folks are talking about. You cannot spend too much time in a process developing that common language, I think. The second thing that we've seen in a lot of these um, conversations is there's some confusion about why you need an agenda anyway. And so some people are afraid to sign on to an agenda if it means they're not going to be able to innovate. Uh, some people don't want to sign on to an agenda if it means we're kind of setting ourselves up to try to answer some questions that may not be answerable and we may not like the answers to it. Um, so is the whole field putting its eggs in the basket where in two or three years research might suggest, yeah, you know what? Natural History Museums, yeah, they're not that important for learning. I don't think we need to worry about either of those possibilities, and I, I don't think we should think about an agenda as really a shared um, piece of work. It's, it's really more of a roadmap, is the way I've been thinking about it, to places the field might want to go. I mean, the problem is not that there aren't lots of great ideas out there. The problem is that we're not talking to each other or kind of pulling together as a field. So I see these agendas, they don't give marching orders, but they provide examples of what other people in the field are talking about and working at, you know, like, like a roadmap. People can go in different directions, they can head to different destinations, but at least we've begun to understand what the complete space of that conversation looks like. And that's really important in a research field. Obviously, we have uh, journals and conferences to help us get that situational awareness. Um, in museum learning, we don't all go to the same place. So these agenda processes, I think, are important as ways to establish where that common conversation can occur. And the final thing that I think is important in these agendas, and we really, we've, we've encountered it in each of these three projects, there are some people early on who show up in the process and think that the point of the agenda work is to provide evidence that what they're already doing is effective. They see the greatest threat to something like natural history museums being externals who are attacking the mission and saying, you know, there's not really a lot of learning going on here. I don't know if that's valuable. Should we be investing in something like a museum when we have schools that need to be fixed? And so if you come into this process saying, what I really need is silver bullet evidence to prove that I should be funded, you're not really asking for a research agenda. You're doing some other kind of uh, work. Some other kind of evidence can be, I mean, it's, it's important work, but you're doing really more evaluation or assessment and less research. So understanding what research is and what it's good for is an important part of these agendas, and I would argue the thing that it's good for is innovation. The reason you want a conversation between practice and research in natural history museums is because you'll be able to discover new things that you can do with the museum, new ways to think about learning, um, new ways that these museums need to be looking towards their future um, to be you know, powerful learning environments. Not looking to prove that what happened in the past was worth it but looking to figure out the most productive places to spend our energy going forward in the future. So um, again, thank you uh, for inviting me to attend your meeting. I hope you have a great day, uh, and I look forward to uh, meeting you all uh, at the next meeting in London, hopefully. So this is Kevin Crowley from Pittsburgh signing out.